I'm Athlone Clark. I was born in Jamaica and I moved to the United States in the mid 80s. And uh, I have had many jobs. Um, well, I, maybe I shouldn't refer to it as a job, but I've been in many interesting situations where I was able to pursue my passion as well as make a living at it. Writing is one, was one of those. Um, and then I moved from my writing into visual arts, and I'm kind of in the middle of both as we speak. In your artist statement, you express that you purposefully don't adhere to a particular style and have expressed that spending time trying to find one is a trap. Has experimentation always been a goal of your work? As far as experimentation goes, it's kind of the lifeblood of what I do. And I've always found predictability to be a little bit boring in the sense that I like my results to be unexpected. And that requires a certain um, spontaneity and a certain willingness to work outside the box, so to speak. So I thrive on experimentation. And if you look at my work over a period of time, you would think it was done by different people because I work according to the moment, the mood that I'm in at the particular time. I don't have a style as such, or at least I, I like to think that I don't have a style that I'm a slave to, or I don't have a style that boxes me in. Because sometimes as an artist, when you have gained success with a particular style, the temptation is there to just keep doing the same thing over and over, just with different variations. And for me, you know, I can only speak for me. For some artists, that's fine and more power to them. But for me, I like the anticipation of seeing something completely new when I'm finished with a piece. So I tend to go moment by moment by moment by moment. And I have no really preconceived ideas as to how things will work out. I just go moment by moment and at the end of it all, I step back and I think, oh, this is interesting or I'm actually surprised how this came out. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where do you get the found objects present in your work? I have become accustomed to people asking me, where did you get this or that? Or where did you uh, um, find you know, the various objects that you use in your work. And sometimes, truthfully, the objects find me. And what I mean by that is people bring me stuff all the time. You know, people who know that I work in mixed media found objects. They bring me things all the time and I don't always use them immediately. Sometimes I have them sitting in my studio for years. And then I'm working on a particular painting and I think, wow, that particular object would be perfect for this section and I go in search of it, I find it, and that's how they usually end up in my work. But I also believe that objects have memory. And so what I do is that I try to tap into that memory, not by using things at random, but by kind of studying them and allowing them to tell me their stories. Can you speak a little bit about the emotions your work projects? Well, on the topic of emotions, I see art kind of as a love affair. Not kind of. Art is a love affair for me. And as you know, with love affairs, they involve very complex emotions. So it's never one thing or another. It's never one emotion uh, opposed to another. It really depends on the moment and the, and the particular mood that I'm in. So I think it's very important for an artist to be able to look into the abyss sometimes. You know, it's not always about pretty art. It's not always about mermaids and, and unicorns, you know, although that does have its place. But um, I think it's very important for me as an artist to be able to go to the edge of the abyss and look into the darkness and sometimes bring back the stories or the images that I see. And it's not always pretty. They're not always pretty. Sometimes they... Uh, can be very disturbing to the spirit, um, but art is not supposed to always um, 
be about making people comfortable or relaxed. Sometimes it has to do with shaking up people's, uh, uh, shaking people from their comfort zone, if you will. So I really, in order to be authentic with my expression, I do work that represents the moment that I'm in. I do work that, you know, if I wake up, let's say I'm in a very dark mood or I'm sad about something, I want to do work that represents in an authentic way that particular moment because there's so many people out there that understand uh, pain, insecurities, self-doubt, um, exclusion, racism, sexism, all of these things. These are not necessarily pleasant topics to discuss, but as an artist, I, I make my commentary on these issues through my visual work. In your artist statement, you say a lot of people who collect your work are deep thinkers. How would you talk about your work to someone who is just beginning their art collection or who collects artwork based primarily on aesthetics? When I use the word, when I use the expression or the phrase deep thinkers, it tends to sound a little elitist, like, well, if you're not smart then you can't get my work, but that's not what I mean. What I'm trying to suggest is that the aesthetics pull you in, but once it pulls you in, there's this portal that you can choose to go through or not. If you want it just for the aesthetics, that's fine, but it is more than just aesthetics. There are things that are going on, quote unquote, behind the pretty colors or behind the colors. So, and um, I think I'm trying to convey the idea that it doesn't have to match the carpet or the wallpaper necessarily. And that if you want a painting that goes beyond just being polite on the wall or goes beyond you know it's not it's not threatening it's very safe and it's very uh you know um easy to digest then maybe my work is not for that particular person who is only looking for that I like to, I like, I, 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 I like to attract people who are able to see beyond the obvious. You know what I'm saying? They're, 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 their taste in art is not just about pretty colors, but also about the message that is both, that is both explicit and implicit you know so i have nothing against collectors who love beautiful colors and they don't necessarily want to get into any deep political thought or whatever hey more power to you but the people that i'm trying to attract are those who are able to project an interpretation onto the piece that is deep, that is profound, that reflects their capacity to think beyond just the traditional narrative. You know what I'm saying? So uh, what would be a good piece to illustrate my point? Let's say this piece where I wrote, again, again, the phoenix rises like smoke from a stick of burning incense. You look at it and aesthetically, it's a lot going on. But the whole idea behind it is that 
you will meet challenges in life and some will knock you flat. But if you have the will and the determination to not necessarily see your uh, quote unquote mistakes as mistakes, but rather as an opportunity to learn, rather as lessons. The point in that is that you will find a way to get up. You'll find a way to, 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 to persevere. And at the bottom, you'll see the hands of a woman who is almost 100 years old. And it shows that she has persevered. She has gone through all of the things that would destroy the will of an average person but she has found that resilience in her to be able to live a long, productive life. And so it ends with her sitting here with her hands clasped and possibly thanking her source or her creator for the strength to have made it that far. So aesthetics and deep thinking are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Sometimes they can work together. Is there an overarching theme to this exhibition? Love your neighbor. Do uh, treat people the way you would want to be treated. That's my overarching um, theme in everything that I do. Treat people the way you would want to be treated. And I think if we do that, we will have a much better world. We will have a world of equity and we will have a world, a world of um, a world that is capable of realizing the ideals that we preach about all the time, equality, love, tolerance, whatever. If we treat each other the way we want to be treated, I suspect you'll have a much better world. Who or what are your biggest influences or inspirations? Wow, uh, you know, I grew up in Jamaica where we never really, at least I never thought of it as art, you know, art, art in the sense of you know, um, this is a guy I need to follow, or this is a, a woman who inspires me, whatever. I just, you know, I was just infused by everything that was around me, by the music, by the friends, by, you know, even in high school, you know, the art school, uh, the, the art room where I studied art as a, as, a, as a young man was behind the high school. You know, the physics lab, the chemistry lab, everything was in the main building, but art, uh, uh, what they call it, art room, because it was only one room. It was way in the back of the school, and it kind of sent a really weird message that art was really not that important. It was just a way of padding your resume, your academic resume. But I took it seriously. I was always in the art room, and I was one of the few guys in my high school who studied art at what is called the advanced level. And then once I left high school, I went to university and I went into another profession. But um, yeah, art for me is something that is life transforming. It is my healer. It is my wife. It is also my mistress. It is my friend. At times it feels like an adversary, but it brings me the complete range of emotions. You know what I mean? I'm not one of these artists who will tell you, oh, you know, my heart, my art makes me happy all the time. You know, I, I feel fulfilled when I'm done with it. Sometimes, but there are times when I'm working and I'm conflicted, you know, I might be dealing with something that has to do with racism, I might be dealing with a piece that has to do with lynching, I might be dealing with a piece that has to do with um, poverty, whatever. It puts me in that mood and when you look at my work, what you're actually looking at is the mood that I'm in at that particular moment. You know, so Athlone is not the artist that is known for happy art or, or sad art. He's known for authentic art. If you infuse integrity 
in your work, then what happens is that people who are intuitive, they sense it. They may not necessarily understand it at the moment, but they can sense authenticity. You know what I mean? Same way if someone is lying to you, a lot of times you can sense that something is a little bit off. And so what I try to do is to make sure that my work is authentic. And you may not like it, but that's all right. It's not meant for everybody. Are you familiar with Lonnie Holly? Yes. Huge influence. Okay. Yes. Mr. Imagination may have been before your time. Um, we know. But he was a staple yeah. at Kentuck. Huge. Mm -hmm. Charlie Lucas, not only a friend, but a role model in many, many ways. Hugh, humble and, 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 and just warm. You know, whenever you meet him, there are no heirs. You know, he just, 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 just a, a really nice guy. But his talent is 10 miles deep. That's my friend. Charlie Lucas, and um, beyond that, you know, I look at, I, I, I enjoy, for example, the, the biography of Frida Kahlo and how she had to be literally in her hospital bed, not being able to walk in order to surrender herself to her creative possibilities, her art. Um, Jean-Michel Basquiat, Huge influence. Oh, one other thing, Thornton Dial. You I was going to ask. Is? Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Did I mention her? No, but I. Was... Huge. I did a show at the American Visionary Museum, and uh, they hung one of my paintings next to his. And I was on a cloud for two weeks after that. <laughs> I thought it was the greatest. I've won awards all over the country in different shows and all of that means very little to me. Award is just an award. That's it. But when they hung my painting next to Thornton Dials, that was one of the greatest accolades I had ever gotten in my life. And I, this was probably 10 years ago, and I remember it as if it was yesterday. So he's one of my main sources of inspiration. Can you talk a little bit about your history with Kintuck and why this exhibition is dedicated to Kintuck's founder, Georgine Clark? Well, first of all, when I did Kentuck decades ago, it was not necessarily the biggest show, but it was chock full of quality. And what I learned from that small, relatively small show was that big is not always better. Because sometimes you cannot grow your usefulness. And I think back then, the collectors who came to the show were always open to interacting with the artists, not just necessarily as, as a you know as a business transaction, but you would have people coming back year after year who would know your name and how the kids are doing and how old is summer now and what you know it was it was it, it gave the 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 the, 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 the atmosphere was that of a family type of uh, uh, art show and i remember running into georgine clark back then and it's kind of a weird story uh, everybody wanted to meet Georgine because she was known to be a mover and a shaker and she could make things happen in the art world and you know she you know uh, she was the one who in my mind shone the spotlight on southern vernacular art just as much as anyone else Bill Arnett anyone else she she went out of her way to shine that spotlight on folk art and she 
was organized. She she was responsible for organizing a show that specialized in uh, uh, folk art, southern vernacular art. She made me feel as if the work that I was doing had a voice that people needed to hear. And at that time, I didn't have a lot of encouragement. You know, I was just kind of winging it, hoping that whatever I threw against the wall would eventually stick, whatever. But she helped to give me that encouragement that I needed. So I never forgot her, and I want to say rest in power, Georgie. Your work was well done. You attended the Kentuck Festival of the Arts about seven or eight years, is that correct? Approximately seven, seven, seven or eight years. And the only reason I have not come back is because I, I have come to the understanding that so little time, relatively speaking, the world is huge and I wanted to explore shows in the Midwest. I wanted to explore shows in the West. I wanted to travel all over the country and um, broaden my experience of shows. And having done Kenta for seven years, I figured, you know, it was time to uh, explore something else. And so that's my only reason for not having done it. But um, it is one of the shows that I, to this very day, be thankful for in terms of giving me the exposure that I so desperately needed at the time. What advice would you give a young artist? Don't marry another artist. Oh, <laughs> um, and be careful who you take advice from. That would be the second. But seriously, um, I'd say that you have to be mindful of detractors. There are critics everywhere, and if you're not built for criticism it can stop you in your tracks. You know what I mean? If you are concerned with seeking approval from everyone around, I had a friend recently who did a painting. He sent me the image. I told him what I thought, and he said, I'm doing a survey, thank you. And I said, have you lost your mind? What do you mean you're doing a survey? How can you be original if you're doing surveys? You want to do something that people have never seen before and you want to do something that cuts against the convention. So I think, or cuts across the conventional way of doing things. So I think um, my advice to any young person would be, have a thick skin, develop a thick skin. Um, find a partner that at least has empathy or has some understanding for what you're doing, that you're marching to a different drummer and that with patience, with time, you will eventually uh, manifest what it is you're trying to put forward. As a young person, uh, I'd say just basically enjoy your life, uh, create as much as you can, work at night when the spirits come out, um, work alone as much as you can to avoid distractions. And again, I go back to what I said earlier. This covers everything that we have discussed so far. Treat people the way you want to be treated. You know, um, be respectful to those who earn your respect. And just be resilient, man. You know, don't go beating your drum, telling people how great you are, and you know, um, talking down other people and all of that kind of stuff. Just do your work. Infuse integrity into your work and everything else will fall in place. Integrity, everything will fall in place after that.